In at number 5 we have Berlin Citadel. The Citadel was built in 1559 and is known as one of the best preserved military structures in Europe. It was originally built to protect Spandau from attack. Built specifically to have no blind spots giving an advantage on all sides in the event of an attack. The Citadel has seen a lot of destruction and war since it was built but the most famous ghost to live there is the spirit of Anna Sido. Anna was married but had a love affair with Joachim II, the local ruler at the time. As the ruler was dying he asked his son to take care of Anna. The affair had been frowned upon but as both of their parents had passed they had grown closer before he got sick. When he passed his son didn't keep his promise. He immediately imprisoned her in the citadel. No one ever saw Anna again after that. There was no explanation as to where she had gone or if she had been punished for her love affair with the ruler. There had been reports from visitors of the white lady, a ghost seen walking around the citadel late at night. Some felt a sudden cold breeze and feeling of dread while walking around the grounds but still there was no explanation. Years later the citadel was a big tourist attraction and renovations took place. While they began to renovate they found the remains of Anna. She had been walled into a cell and left there. This seemed to confirm the rumours that she was the white lady for all these years. Some people have seen her late at night but others have felt her presence. Even after she was found her spirit had remained. If you visited today you might catch a glimpse of her if you were to be there after nightfall. Coming in at number 4 we have Svitkov Castle. The origin of Svitkov goes back to the prehistoric times. A fort was built there in the 1st century AD. So it's on the edge of a lake covered in all sides by water making it the perfect place if you're worried about intruders. The castle was built in the early 13th century by King Otaka. It is not known when it was built but the first written mention of the castle was in 1234 when it was owned by the King of Bohemia. It had many owners throughout the years being seized in wars and passed to new rulers. It is now owned by the National Heritage Institute and is open to guests. It is regarded by locals as the creepiest place in Germany. Many refuse to visit or leave before it gets dark as not to disturb the spirits they believe to live there. They believe that the castle is home to a dark supernatural entity. They believe it had been since prehistoric times and has never left the land. There are often voices heard from around the castle. Technical faults happen often with no explanation. It's also been said many animals refuse to go into the building and act strange on the land outside the castle. There have been many times where the staff had lit candles to light up the halls when night falls. There have been times when every candle had been blown out at once, sending chills down the spines of anyone in the area. The most haunted part of the castle is the main town. Tower. There are reports that if you sleep in the tower you will pass away within the year. There are at least two confirmed cases of this happening throughout the castle's history. Number 3 on this list is the Five Fishermen Restaurant. This is a restaurant in Halifax, Nova Scotia known for its exceptional oysters and also its ghostly inhabitants. The ground that this restaurant sits on wasn't always utilized for serving up fish and chips though. In fact, it has a very long history. In the early 1800s is when the building went up and for a long time it acted as the town's only school. Nothing ghoulish or demonic about that. However, at around the turn of the century the school moved and the building took on a new purpose. It became the mortuary for Halifax and made its dealings with the dead. Now not every mortuary is going to become haunted but this one had quite a lot to deal with over the years. In 1912 the unsinkable ship, the Titanic, sunk. It sunk roughly 640 kilometers off of the eastern shores of Canada and therefore the closest places to assist with the rescue was these eastern provinces. Halifax acted as the leader in these rescue processes and because of that the mortuary had an onslaught of bodies of people whom had died on the ship. Five years after that tragedy Halifax incurred one of their own with the massive Halifax explosion. This was where a munitions ship exploded and it killed roughly 2,000 people just like that. This mortuary served as the primary designation for both of these incidents and due to the unnatural deaths here it makes sense that some spirits have clung on. Guests and employees alike have reported seeing ghosts all over this mortuary that turned restaurant. One of the dishwashers reported running out of the restaurant when he looked up from what he was doing and was staring directly at a ghost like specter. The restaurant has attempted to have serious renovations done however I don't think that any amount of structural change will get these spirits to rest for good. Number 2 on this list is the Frank Slide. Now even though the Frank Slide sounds like it could be a fun, popular dance move that takes over TikTok for a few weeks, it is far more morbid than that. On April 29th in 1903 in the mining town of Frank, which at that time was part of the Northwest Territories but it is now a section of Alberta, there was a horrible tragedy. 110 million tons of limestone and rock came tumbling down in one of Canada's biggest landslides ever. This fell onto 
part of the town of Frank. Frank was located right next to Turtle Mountain, which after extensive mining had grown unstable. On April 29th, it all came crashing down and claimed the lives of 70 to 90 people. It is still to this day Canada's most deadly landslide to ever occur in history and was a horrible tragedy that can only remind us how fleeting life can be. I think the craziest part about this landslide as well is that it wasn't just miners who were killed. Their wives, their families, all of them died at the hands of the Frank Slide. The remains of these bodies were never recovered either as the damage from the slide was far too devastating. Where all of this happened is now a section of a town called Crow's Nest Pass and over a century later the ghosts of the dead still haunt the area. This place is somewhere where visitors have reported feeling very unsafe. They say that the overall feelings of uneasiness are almost too much to bear and that they have to leave. Cries howls, screams, this can all be heard late at night as you're trying to sleep. Lanterns will be seen in the night walking around at the hands of unknown apparitions. It is basically a full ghost town of people who never deserve to die in the first place, all wanting to get a second just to feel their lives again as they were so unfairly ripped away from them. Definitely one of Canada's most horrific tragedies and now home to one of its most haunted locations. Number one on this list is the Banff Springs Hotel. This hotel is located in Banff, Alberta and is truly one of the creepiest places that I've ever read about. Now first off, I want to note the hotel itself looks gorgeous on the outside. The beautiful nature it is surrounded by is stunning and the hotel gives me some serious Harry Potter Hogwarts vibes. However, when I say that this place is surrounded by nature, I really mean it. It is totally out on its own with no other buildings in sight at all. The secluded site has been around for 132 years and has housed its fair share of visitors. Some of these visitors have had some incredible stays. I mean, when you look it up online, the hotel has a 4.7 Google rating. So, I mean, it's pretty freaking good. Some of the guests, though, they never checked out. In the 1920s, a couple was set to have their wedding at this hotel. On the day of the ceremony, though, the bride, while she was walking down one of the hotel's beautiful marble staircases, tripped and fell, smacking her head on her descent and dying on the spot. This bride's spirit is one of the most notable sightings people have had when they're staying at this hotel. It's it's said that they often see a phantom in a wedding dress ascending and descending the stairs very quickly. She's also been seen in the ballroom dancing alone, potentially dreaming of the dance that she wanted so desperately to have with the husband that she never got to marry. In 1975, a longtime bellman of the hotel, Sam, died there. Since then, sightings of Sam have been pretty consistent. One story details how two women lost their room key and called the front desk to go and get it. The front desk person sent someone to go and open the room for these ladies. When that person had got there though, the ladies were already in the room and said that another bellman had let them in. They described Sam to a T when they spoke about the bellman who helped them out. Instances like this have occurred time and time again at the hotel with many people believing his spirit is still working there. Finally with this hotel, you have room 873. Room 873 is rumored to be the home of a gruesome murder. One evening a family was staying there and the father for some unknown reason lost his mind murdering his family and himself. After completely refurbishing the room, the hotel put it back in service. But now people who have stayed there report hearing the screams and the cries as if they were still dying. If you have to stay at this hotel, definitely avoid room 873. Coming in at number 5 is the hospital of Colorno in Parma. It's considered to be be one of the most haunted places in Italy. This asylum began in 1873 and was only used for psychiatric patients and later a hospital for the mentally ill. Later on, they had begun housing people like prostitutes, alcoholics, and even small children, deemed by society as dangerous. At first, only being a temporary situation for patients soon became their permanent home. Doctors and psychiatrists working performed experimental new treatments on the patients, like frontal lobotomies and electroshock therapy. Patients were locked away in small rooms many forced to stay all day long like they were prisoners, many getting very claustrophobic and people have said they can see drawings and scratch marks on the inside of the doors from past patients staying in the rooms. The hospitals were closed down in 1979 and now remains abandoned, but the inside still has clothes, scattered documents, old wheelchairs and blankets. The front area is completely grown over with shrubs, vines and trees. Anyone can go and visit the asylum and many who have gone claim they have heard doors slamming, loud thuds, sounds of water and even seen the ghosts of patients roaming the halls.
Coming in at number four, we have Villa de Vici. Number four is Villa de Vici, or the Red House. Considered to be the most haunted house in all of Italy, it was commissioned by Count Felix de Vici, who was the head of the Italian National Guard. The home was built in 1854 by architect Alessandro Sedoli and was Count Felix de Vici's summer home. Unfortunately, Sedoli wasn't able to see the completion of the home due to his death during the construction of the property. Legend has it that the Count returned home to a tragedy regarding his wife and daughters, and later took his own life inside of the house. After the Count's death, his brother had taken over the property and owned it until 1938 before it was left abandoned for the next two decades. Popular occultist Alistair Crowley had been rumoured to spend some time at the home sometime in the 1920s. Fans and followers of Crowley soon began to visit the mansion and some say they performed satanic rituals. A broken piano remains in the abandoned mansion and visitors have claimed to hear it playing while they were there. Others also say ghosts roam the house to this day. Number three on this list is Central City Masonic Cemetery. Of course we had to have a cemetery on this list. No haunted place list would be complete without at least one of them. Thrillist says, founded as a mining town in the late 1800s, Central City is now known as a destination for those looking to head to the hills for a gambling fix in the casinos that now dot the area. But one thing hasn't changed. The woman in black who twice a year appears in this hilltop cemetery above the town. Known as the Columbine Lady, she comes to visit the grave of John Cameron, a prominent former resident of Central City who died in 1884. Some believe she is his fiance, appearing to leave flowers for her lost love on November 1st, the anniversary of Cameron's death, and April 5th, a date for which the significance remains a mystery, much like the woman herself. This place is safe to go to if of course you do not go during these times. She's been coming for a long time and anyone who tried to interfere with her has had to pay the price. Now people kind of suspect that she was in a relationship with John Cameron, but there's also another theory. Many people think that John actually wronged her in his life and that this woman in black comes twice a year to double check that John is still dead and hasn't come back to life by some means. Pretty scary tale for sure, one that you probably don't want to get involved with. Number two on this list is the bra. Moore. Located in Colorado Springs, this hotel would be freaking awesome if it wasn't so haunted. Thrillist says this sprawling five-star hotel has a lot to offer for anyone seeking a relaxing and indulgent getaway. But along with the golf course, spa, and nearby zoo, there's one feature you won't find in any brochure. Staff and guests alike have reported the presence of a woman, often in the penthouse where Julia Penrose, co-founder of the property, once lived. While not confirmed, Penrose's death is said to have been surrounded by a strange occurrence in which she went missing and was later found confused and shaking in the woods nearby with no memory of how she got there. She passed away a week later and perhaps her spirit remains watching over the property and seeking answers about her own mysterious death. Now I am wondering man, how did Penrose die? Like this whole story feels like a movie or something like that. I truly think somebody needs to get in here and investigate what the heck happened here. Cause like, should we be scared of the region because this is gonna happen again? Was Julia doing something specific before she disappeared and should we avoid doing that thing? There are just so many questions that need to be answered here and sadly I can't do it from the comfort of Toronto. That being said, I'm also not trying to end up like Julia and therefore we'll be leaving this job to somebody far more quiet. Qualified. And finally, number one on this list is the Highlands Ranch Mansion. A truly picturesque mansion, one that's been standing for over 100 years and one that's home to a ghostly spirit. Thrillist says this sprawling stone mansion built in 1891 is often rented for weddings and events due to its impressive structural beauty and picturesque prairie views. But it's also a historic property and somewhat of a museum of the times with a bit of paranormal activity sprinkled in. The ghost of Julia Kistler, daughter of F. Kistler, who bought the property in 1926, is said to haunt the home with visitors and staff alike reporting hearing a woman's sobs, seeing a silhouette figure moving about when the mansion was otherwise vacant, and lights sporadically turning on and off. I don't know about you guys, but during my wedding ceremony, I want to hear beautiful sounding music, not the sobs of some ghost woman thing. Apparently, 
Suddenly she's crying all the time and this woman's emotions are not something to play with. There's a story where once several children were playing around here. There was a wedding ceremony scheduled here for later that day and the children were off doing what kids do before the proceedings got underway. They ran into this ghost crying and then they started to make fun of her. They were rude and definitely unkind but they also didn't deserve what she did next. It's said that in a fit of rage she flew inside their bodies and possessed each and every one of them for a short time showing them things that were truly terrifying. Things that have ultimately changed those boys lives and altered their mentality forever. Any ghost that's capable of doing something like that, that's one that I don't want to be around. Coming in at number 5 we have South Manitou Island in Leland. South Manitou Island is part of an island chain in Lake Michigan that extends north to the Straits of Mackinac. The only public access is by ferry from Leland, Michigan. The island consists of a ridge of tilted layers of limestone buried under a blanket of glacial debris. 16 miles offshore from the Lilano Peninsula, featuring 300 foot sand dunes, deserted shoreline and empty campground, it's about as terrestrially creepy as you can get in Michigan. In the 1800s, the island became a popular harbour for ships traversing the newly built Erie Canal into the Great Lakes and on to Chicago. One local legend surrounds a ship full of passengers stricken with cholera stopped at South Manitou, where sailors buried their victims in a mass grave, some of them still alive at the time. Soon after this incident, the first appearance of ghosts and hauntings began. The mass grave is believed to be near the old cemetery just north of the bay campground. This is also near where the old dock used to be located. Additionally, the passage between mainland Michigan and Manitou is one of the deadliest sections of Lake Michigan. This is due to a sudden weather change, creating a navigational hazard, causing over 50 known shipwrecks. Traffic was quite busy here during the late 1800s and there were frequent accidents where ships would literally run into each other. Off the coast of the island lies the shipwreck of the SS Francisco Morazin, where rumours say a young island boy died after trying to explore on his own. There are also two cemeteries on the island and an ancient cedar forest where voices are said to be heard. The haunting of this island is so bad it has driven park rangers to go mad and demand to be taken off the island. One ranger even confessed to hearing voices, footsteps and slamming of doors inside buildings that were otherwise unoccupied. Coming in at number 4 we have Masonic Temple. With over 16 floors and 1000 rooms, this gothic temple is one of the most striking buildings in Detroit. Furthermore, this is the largest Masonic temple in the world. According to rumours, there are hidden passageways, rooms and staircases, so be careful as you might get lost quite quickly within the walls of this temple. The most famous urban myth associated with the temple is that of the architect George D. Mason. Legend has it that Mason went bankrupt funding the construction of the temple. He was going through financial difficulties and was very close to foreclosure. Due to this stress, George D. jumped to his death from the roof. This story will back up the fact that many reports of a ghost climbing the steps to the roof of the building as if stuck in a loop of his darkest moment. Even scarier, additionally, guards frequently find the door to the roof unlocked, even when it was just checked moments earlier. Additionally, the temple has various cold spots and doors are reported to close suddenly. One of the roof doors is said to swing open just moments after it is locked by a watchman. Many people report the feeling of being watched while inside of the building. Coming in at number 3, Osnabrück. Osnabrück was once the site in a major pagan temple and burial area. The pagans decided that they would attempt to convert the German people to the Christian faith. This led to a massacre taking place at the temple. The local forces took the lives of those there including the priests. They then desecrated the graves and broke their altar stones. The pagans built their temples and buried the dead on sacred land. It is believed that this act disturbed the deep magic infused in the land. Now every year during the winter solstice and summer equinox something strange happens on the land. Strange orbs of light have been seen moving around the area. Screams are heard from miles away. Stains appear on the stones that still lay there today. Although the town have now been built away from the graveyard you can still visit today. Many locals avoid the land as the spirits there seem angry about what happened to their descendants. It is thought these spirits wield great power and could have revenge when and if they choose to. If you do choose to visit you need to be warned to be respectful. Do your research before and careful when you arrive. Many have reported seeing terrifying things or feelings like being watched while there. No one visits during the solstice and equinox as this is when the spirits are the most active. 
Coming in at number 2 we have Peacock Island. Peacock Island is situated in the River Havel in Berlin. In 1685 chemist Johann Kuchnell was given financial aid to build a glass foundry on the east of the island. Here he discovered how to produce artificial red glass. When he left the island in 1692 it remained unused for about 100 years until 1793. In 1793 the Prussian King Frederick built the castle for himself and his mistress. This was then passed down through the family and used for many different reasons including being used as an exotic farm. Although the island has a long and exciting history, there are claims it is the original Johann Kuchnell who inhabits the island long after his death. It is claimed that Johann was not only into creating glass, but that he experimented with dark magic. It is believed that through his experiments with black magic, he had cursed himself. He attempted to flee the island as to not be attached to the curse, but this didn't work. In the afterlife, he was bound to the land and his old foundry. Those who have visited the island have seen a black figure with glowing red eyes. He is often seen at the stroke of midnight. When he is near, you can feel the chill in your bones. You know that you are in the presence of darkness just by being on the island during his hour. His laboratory still stands today and some have tried to find his old lab to learn all the dark magic and secrets that he tried to hide. It is said a fire nearly destroyed the building. The police believe this to be man made and it's speculated he was trying to destroy the demons and spirits he had accidentally been working with in the lab. He couldn't escape the curse and if you don't want to meet the same fate, I would avoid visiting this building. And finally in at number 1 we have the Waldneil Hostert School. The school was first built in 1913 and then closed in 1937 when it was then used by the National Socialism Party. They wanted to use the building as part of their euthanasia program. They wanted to make their bloodlines pure and strong and they had the idea to use the building to house anyone who was not seen as genetically healthy. All those with hereditary illnesses or who were severely mentally and physically handicapped were classified as lives unworthy of life. They would invite the people they deemed to fall into this category to live in the facility before they would eliminate them. According to data collected, more than 260,000 people fell victim to their war against sick. This was just one of many of these facilities run around Germany. With all of the horrible acts committed here, it is no surprise that it is haunted with the lost souls. The people lost here were taken suddenly and their spirits remain unable to pass on. Some people who have visited reporting hearing blood curdling cries coming up the walls in every direction. Others have seen shadows darting from room to room as though they are watching those who walk there. Other ghosts have been seen looking through the windows or sitting inside the rooms late at night. They don't seem to have bad intentions but they seem to be distraught which can be equally as dangerous if you were to stumble across them unknowingly. Some even claim to see children who have disappeared as soon as they were noticed. The stories from those who have visited are terrifying and chilling to hear. It is enough to warn anyone away from attempting to visit the old school. Number 5 on this list is the Carolina Inn. This inn has actually been voted one of the most haunted in America by a few different lists. The University of North Carolina says the Carolina Inn was built in 1924 and quickly became a popular hotel for visitors and graduates of the university. In 1948, the Carolina Inn's most long lasting guests checked in and apparently never left. Dr. William Jacox was a fun loving man with a witty sense of humor, had recently retired from practicing medicine and decided to make the Carolina Inn his final home. He lived in room 252 for 17 years before his death in 1965. As shared by the Carolina Inn, guests that have stayed in Jacox's old room report being inexplicably locked out of the suite. One time the lock was so stubborn that a workman had to use a ladder to break into the room. Visitors have also noticed strange occurrences such as messy bath mats and previously closed curtains being pulled wide open. Some have encountered the smell of freshly cut flowers despite none being in the room and felt their bodies become strangely cold for no apparent reason. This is only part of the stuff that goes down at this room as well guys. Some people have reported seeing a poorly dressed man approach them looking for an unlocked door and then if they show it to him, he runs away screaming. It's thought that this is the ghost of Dr. William Jacox. I don't know why unlocked doors scare this dude so much, but anyone who's gonna spend 17 years in this hotel is probably a bit of a weird dude. Unless you want to deal with a crazy old doctor ghost messing with you all vacation, I'd stay at a different inn. Number 4 on this list is the new Hanover County Library. I don't know why guys, but something about haunted libraries is just so intriguing to me. Like it just seems so mystical and mysterious I guess. This haunted library is located right in Wilmington. There is a woman that haunts this place who is believed to be a patron. Apparently she used to donate quite generously to this library and in death doesn't want to leave it behind. She isn't the only ghost that walks the halls here and haunts the books. There's a male poltergeist who makes his presence quite known as well. 
He apparently died in a duel that happened here many years ago before this land was turned into a library. Nowadays, these two ghosts make it very hard to do any serious learning or studying considering they haunt the place so much. The woman isn't too bad, she just shows up and looks super creepy, but from my reading, she only actually punishes those who cause harm to the library or make fun of it. Those who come here to learn and to read, she leaves them be for the most part. The man, however, is certainly quite the pest. He often messes with those that come here and makes it very difficult for people to accomplish anything. I love libraries, I think that we should all go to them more often, but maybe just not this one specifically. Coming in at number 3, Villa Magnoni. Next on the list is another abandoned house, the Villa Magnoni, and what makes this story even creepier is not much is known about this house, like who built it or why it has become abandoned. Many attempts to sell the house have failed time and time again. It's now owned by the University of Ferrara. They wanted to turn the villa into a research lab, yet to this day nothing has been done about that. The events in the 1980s really turned this place into a very haunted attraction and gave it its infamous name of the Curse of Villa Magnoni. Four men went to check out the abandoned villa one day and claimed to hear children's voices in the distance. They ran towards it, but nothing was there. Instead, they saw an old woman behind one of the windows screaming at them in a violent rage, telling them to leave now and to never return. The men were terrified and ran, but unfortunately they were all hit by a car, and three out of four of them lost their their lives. Due to the tragedy of the guy's death, the town council of Kona had all doors and windows of the villa walled up. But oddly enough, a week later, the window the men had seen the old woman in was now open. Other tourists since then say they have heard a woman whispering threats whenever they pass the house. Number two, we have Chesa de Morty. Our number two spot is given to Chesa de Morty, or more commonly known as the Chapel of the Dead. It's a small church located in central Italy. The church was built in the 11th century by the Normans in a town called Otranto. This popular horror destination got its name from the 813 casualties beheaded during the Turkish massacre of 1480. 128 Ottoman ships landed on the shores of Otranto, and their plan was to take over Italy. It was a violent and bloody attack. The Otranto Atlanteans fought back, but in the end were no match for the Otamans, who went around killing, looting, and setting fire to everything in their path. Once the massive attack was over, the Otamans made their way to the Otranto Cathedral and found a small group of Christians and attempted to convert them to Islam. When they refused, the Ottomans began to attack and kill all the Christians in the church that day. Thankfully, three kings of Naples, Aragon, and Sicily recaptured southern Italy and forced the Ottomans out. In 1711, a chapel was built off the main cathedral dedicated to those killed in the attack. Eighteen bodies bodies have been mummified and put on display behind the altar along with 100 skulls. This area is known as the Mummy Cemetery. If you're brave enough to go on a tour of this church, the tour guide can tell you how each of the mummies on display passed away. There is also a dungeon-like crypt you can also visit at the church filled with mummified and skeletal remains displayed. And finally coming in at number one, we have Paveglia Island. Paveglia Island, also known as the Island of the Ghosts or the Forbidden Island. Paveglia is a small island between Venice and Lido. This little island was used to quarantine individuals suffering from the plague and other diseases. Many individuals were there living out their final days before being burned in mass graves. If anyone in the surrounding areas were even remotely sick, they were shipped off to the island to be separated from the healthy people and left there to die. In 1922, the island was turned into a mental hospital, bringing in even more tragedy to this already harrowing place. The doctor that ran the hospital conducted many brutal experiments on the patients on the island. He believed that mental illness could be treated and cured with lobotomies, using tools such as hammers, drills, and chisels to perform these experiments. Many say the doctor eventually went mad and took his own life by jumping off the bell tower. A nurse working witnessed this and stated that the doctor survived the fall but was choked to death by a mysterious mist. Somehow the mental hospital 
hospital stayed open until 1968 before it was abandoned to this day. More than 160,000 victims were cremated on this island over the years, and even today, more than 50% of the soil on the island is made up of human ash. The island has remained untouched for decades, and locals and tourists are banned from visiting. Even though the island doesn't allow tourists, many paranormal groups have filmed episodes about their findings on the island. The Ghost Adventures crew spent 24 hours on the island, and they experienced many things such as creepy music, weird energy, unexplainable equipment malfunctions, and when using their ghost monitors, they flew off the charts. Needless to say, this is one of the most, if not the most, creepy and haunted place in Italy, if not the world. Number 5 on this list is Casa Lercaro. This is a beautiful casa in tenor life and there is a ghost that haunts it consistently. Idealista says, The origins of this scary story are related to the old house of the Lacaro family which is located in Caladin San Augustin and dates back to the late 16th century. Catalina lived in this building. Many believe that this girl was the daughter of Antonio Lacaro and that she was forced to marry an elderly man and for this reason the young woman decided to take her own life by throwing herself into a well at the back of the house, an area which is now closed with a wall. Legend has it that Catalina's body is buried in one of the rooms within the house and haunts the property to this day. This is due to the fact that because she took her own life, the church denied giving her a Christian burial in a cemetery. This lack of a proper burial is probably leading to the fact that her ghost can't rest. As we've seen before on this channel countless times, people who get cast away like that regardless of their circumstances, their spirit often clings to the living. I doubt that they can help this in any way, it's just kind of the way things like this operate. It also doesn't help getting your body literally stuffed into the walls of your building and also taking your own life usually isn't the best either. Regardless of why this place is haunted though, it definitely is. The disembodied voice of this woman is heard frequently and it often manifests itself in this shrieking scream cry that's very unsettling for all of those who listen. Some have seen her apparition appear before them, but apparently this is a pretty rare occurrence. Number 4 on this list is the Madrid Sanatorium. As with most countries, there is a sanatorium that makes the list as being one of the most haunted. It just so happens to be one of the locations that sees the most tragedies in the world and therefore often has a clumping of dark spirits and energy. Idealista says, This sanatorium in the region of Madrid was built in 1941 to treat some of the most serious diseases that were plaguing the civilian population back then. These diseases were tuberculosis, leprosy, polio, fibrosis, and lung cancer. It was eventually converted into a psychiatric hospital and in 1995, it closed its doors once and for all. Until not long ago, it was possible to go inside and visitors could find the records and personal objects of former patients. Those who have been there speak of mysterious presences in the corridors, electrical devices that strangely stop working for no reason, and doors that suddenly close violently. Many people also claim to have seen lights in the immensity of plants that resemble lanterns walking around. I mean, it really is no wonder why this place is haunted, guys. We went from a sanatorium to a psychiatric hospital, and it's clear that both places saw a lot of death in their time. It should also be noted that psychiatric hospitals back in the day were not nearly as good as they are now. People were very often mistreated at these places, and it's not common to see those spirits linger on. There truly is no reason for you to be traveling to this place other than to test your luck with the ghosts. Something that I really don't recommend doing. Coming in at number 3 we have Doherty Hotel. The Doherty family has owned and operated the hotel since it opened in the 1920s. The Doherty men were and remain the business managers, however as the current owner Jim Doherty tells it, it was the Doherty women who were the heart and soul of the business. The hotel has a colourful history. During Prohibition it was a speakeasy, a place for backroom gambling and adult entertainment. It was also a meeting place for the Mafia and Purple Gang. Here they worked out their differences. In 19 
1938, the hotel was the site of one of the Michigan's most notorious murders. Asaya Lebo, former Purple Gang attorney turned Purple Gang businessman, was murdered in the bar. He was shot by his cousin and business partner Jack Livingston and sadly passed away. Ever since, there have been numerous hauntings. Some believe it's Lebo who haunts the ground or grandmother Helen Doherty who passed away at the hotel. But there is one thing for sure and it's the many ghost stories that are now associated with the hotel. Guests, visitors, investigators, employees and the owners have all had some kind of paranormal experience at the hotel which includes perfume scent wafting through occasionally, loud knocking, bedroom doors open and close by themselves and dark apparitions and shadowy figures have been spotted anywhere from the lobby to the top floor. Also the spirits of other murder victims roam the halls, lobbies and rooms while some can be seen, others prefer to just make noise. Coming in at number 2 we have Michigan's first state prison. Established in 1838, Michigan's first state prison remained in operation through 1934. The prison served as the nucleus for the city as it spanned some 20 acres. Over the years it relocated and at one point became the largest walled prison in the world with around 6,000 inmates. In 1952, in response to poor medical care, brutality from the guards and bad food, two maximum security prisoners took hold of a guard and used his keys to release other inmates. A days long riot ensued, resulting in nine guards being held hostage. Additionally, the riot resulted in the deaths of several inmates and guards before it was extinguished by the National Guard. The inmates fought for and won a list of 11 demands for reform. Today, the old prison has become the Armory Arts Village, a residence and studio for local artisans. Apartments are very contemporary and halls are covered with artwork. In spite of its modern renovations and freshly painted walls, though, rumors persist of its haunting. Visitors, workers, and artists of the space claim some prisoners and guards still haunt their former home. Residual sounds of riots are also frequently reported due to the prison's history of such occurrences. Judy Krasnow, an employee at the renovated Arts Village, hosts daytime historic tours of the prison, so a visitor can see the hauntings for themselves. She is also a resident of the prison and lives on site. She has confessed she believes her apartment, which was once a series of prison cells, has ghosts. Furthermore, Judy is not the only resident who believes that. Even though the upper floors have undergone renovations, the underground section that holds solitary confinement remains structurally intact. Although cells have been removed, there is intensity in this area that cannot be denied. And finally, in at number one, we have the Whitney Restaurant. Located on Woodward Avenue, Restaurant Whitney was the former mansion home of David Whitney. David was one of the Midwest's wealthiest lumber barons at the turn of the century, and he built this magnificent 21,000 square foot home in 1894. The mansion was restored in the mid 1980s, and since then, reports of unexplained paranormal activities have been reported. Such as shadow figures have been seen on the second floor, disembodied voices have been heard, and other strange phenomena have occurred. It is known that the mansion is haunted by Whitney and his first wife, Flora. Flora always wanted to live in a mansion but died before the home was finished, leaving Whitney to raise their four children. A year after Flora's death, Whitney married her sister, Sarah, leaving Flora's ghost to forever live in distress. The paranormal activity within the restaurant is not for the faint hearted, as there have been reports of the elevator traveling between floors on its own with no one inside to operate it. Furthermore, ghosts have been witnessed on the upper floors, with one staff member seeing an older man looking out the window. The staff member approached the man, asking him to leave, and right before the staff's eyes, the man vanishes into the floor. Other reports include noises that sound like silverware and kitchenware being handled and or stacked and table settings keep getting moved around by some unseen presence. The outhouse is said to be the most haunted part of the property. It was originally built for Whitney's slaves and has been largely untouched for years, mostly due to the fear of paranormal. Inside the outhouse is a dining table that is set for the afternoon tea and has been untouched for as long as anyone can remember. Today it is still perfectly set but covered in a thick layer of dust. Adding to the ghostly atmosphere, the outhouse has no electricity, so sits in the darkness at night. A tour guide who once worked at the Whitney insisted that the building was haunted for his experiences working there. The worker claims a group of dolls vanished from a room inside the building. Also, the worker has reported hearing his name being called from an empty area of the building. The Whitney Mansion is an elegant and beautiful property, but has high body counts, a haunting history, and plenty of supernatural sightings still happening today. Number five on this list is the Plaza Theatre Performing. Art Center. 
Built in 1930, this beautiful theater has had many shows and screenings here over the years. For 55 years, it was in operation as one of the premier spots to have your movie shown, but in 1985, the theater shut down. It remained as such for about 20 years when in 2006, it began to get renovated. Now it's mainly just for live theater and other performance art in the city of El Paso. Like a lot of beautiful old theaters though, as time passes, legends emerge, and this one in particular certainly has its fair share. The Plaza Theater for Performance Arts Center has three primary ghostly apparitions at houses. The first is our very standard and very classic drifting woman in white. Looking sad and down on her luck, the spirit of this woman will often drift around through the rafters and has been seen by many workers throughout the years. The second is a man in all black who materializes in front of people. He's described a bit like a shadow creature, but slightly less menacing. I suppose if we have our woman in white, it's only fitting that we have a man in black to get a little bit of variety going. The third ghost sticks with the theme of spicing things up and is actually a little boy with a bouncing ball. It's not a basketball, but a small bouncy ball that the child seemingly plays with as he haunts the theater. Nobody knows the origin of these ghosts or how they got here at all. Are they connected? Maybe once a family unit who died here together, or are they all separate and have each suffered strange tragedies at this location over the century? El Paso, I'm sure, has some other theaters, and I'd stick to those ones if you're looking to watch some live shows if you're there. Number four on this list is Henley Row. Located on the Texan island of Galveston on the Gulf Coast, this is the most famous haunted spot for locals in the region. Texas Highways writes, It's not surprising that Henley Row is a hot spot for supernatural activity. Completed between 1855 and 1858 for shippers and cotton brokers, it was the town's tallest structure during the Civil War. The roof doubled as a Confederate lookout for Union ships. Galveston and nearby barrier islands, history had been laced with tragedy. It was the site of a bloody civil war fight and serial epidemics of yellow fever decimated the populace. Hurricanes blast through regularly, the 1990 storm left up to 12,000 casualties and the worst natural disaster in US history. No wonder Texas writer Brian Woolley called Galveston an old cemetery with a beach attached. The resident ghosts of Henley Row represent aspects of Galveston history. There's the Confederate soldier seen on the roof and around the building. The bloodied teenage factory worker is a vestige of the building's cotton grading days. The lady in white and the running and playing little boy and little girl are thought to be 1900 storm victims. The upper floors house apartments and offices now, but Henley Market's glass ceiling reveals views of stairs and landings. During renovations, workers reported tools mysteriously moving around. Staff recall other spooky experiences as well. Some years ago, a friend gave her old photo of Dr. Wilbur from a house on Church Street that's always displayed in the shop. When Hurricane Ike inundated the building with 10 feet of water in 2008, the photo went undamaged while many other things were destroyed. Every year on November 1st, employees construct an elaborate Day of the Dead altar that includes the photo and lighted candles. Before closing, the staff follows a three-person backup routine to ensure the candles are completely extinguished, even dousing them with water. Yet almost every single year, one or more candles are burning the next morning. I can't imagine working at a place where we had to light candles for our ghost altar. Like that action alone would make me want to quit immediately. I I suppose the one good thing is that the ghosts here don't appear to be particularly evil or wanting to inflict harm. Still though, waking up and heading to work is already a tall task as it is, but knowing that there's a dead little boy and girl waiting there? Yeah, that's a solid no-go for me. Number three on this list is Fort Fisher. Fort Fisher was a critical fort during the American Civil War. It was used by the Confederate Army and was pretty instrumental for them from 1861 to 1865. This fort was used to protect an important trade post there that the Army needed. They defended this place for those four years, but then in 1865, the Union Army came in and was finally able to capture it. This battle was a very bloody one and was actually huge for the Union army in the overall scope of the war. Apparently there was a lot of death at this fort and that death 
It's never really gone away. Now this fort is teeming with paranormal activity. Visitors will often report hearing gunshots coming from thin air. The sounds of many footsteps all running at once as if people were charging ahead. Orbs of energy appear in front of them from no apparent source. There are two very famous ghosts that haunt this place as well. Robert E. Harrell and General William Whitling. Robert was apparently an outcast who died under mysterious circumstances and has not been able to rest since. The General was actually taken prisoner and killed at Fort Columbus, but he returned to this place because he feels regret for how he failed in life. He was apparently responsible for defending this place and was not capable of doing so. A very haunted fort that I wouldn't recommend going to. Number two on this list is Lydia's Bridge. Who is Lydia and why does she have a bridge and why is it haunted? Well, Lydia is quite the famous ghost. This is a true ghost. Like when you think of a ghost and a ghost story, this meets all the criteria for a good one. Spectrum Local News says, people traveling between Jamestown and Greensboro on US Highway 70A said they've encountered the ghost of Lydia, a hitchhiker. If she's picked up, she gets into the car and vanishes before she reaches the requested destination. Various versions of the Lydia legend have been passed along over the years, and there are apparently 11 different versions of the story that are set in North North Carolina. It's common for folks to go ghost hunting for Lydia near the bridge. In the book, Looking for Lydia, historians Michael Reniger and Amy Greer cite the 1923 death of Annie C. Johnson as the real life Lydia who died after a car flipped in 1920. That is a story with some history, man. Literally since the 1920s this has been going on and there are 11 different versions of the story. A story like this isn't just made up, it's not just something that one person posted on creepypasta that became a thing. No, this has been part of the identity of North Carolina for a century. Countless people have picked up this woman and then had her disappear right before their very eyes. Car accidents have happened for people driving this woman and then getting so shocked that they spin off the road when she disappears. Lydia or... Annie is a real ghost who stalks drivers along this road and especially this bridge. Although she isn't inherently evil in nature, as I said before, accidents have happened when people realize they were just driving a ghost around. I have no idea where Lydia is trying to get to, but trust me, you probably don't want to be the person to take her there. And finally, number one on this list is the Devil's Tramping Grounds. This is in reference to a very strange patch of soil in North Carolina. For decades, this circle of dirt has allowed nothing to grow on it at all whilst the area surrounding it is home to luscious wildlife. The Sun Journal says, regional legend maintains that Satan frequents the area on his nightly walks, pacing the circle as he contemplates his nefarious deeds. Normal vegetation surrounds the circle, but only a wiry grass grows inside it and no plant life of any kind can be found on the path itself. Visitors have also claimed to see red glowing eyes in the circle. Now there could be any number of reasons for why nothing is growing on this patch of dirt. Simply because an area of land cannot grow wildlife doesn't automatically mean the devil himself has anything to do with it. But throw in the fact that there are two red glowing eyes there, plus a few other creepy occurrences and we might just have something demonic afoot. Locals have reported putting objects in the center of the circle, then coming back a little while later and having those same items moved outside the circle. As if someone or something did this deliberately. The thinking is that this circle is a place used by the devil to dance or to perform rituals that we don't understand. Having things inside his circle of death doesn't make for a great dancing spot or sacrificial zone, so those things need to get moved. That's why we see the red eyes in the night and there's an overwhelming sensation of dread in the area. It's the devil doing his devilish things. A daring reporter actually decided to test this theory one evening and slept in the exact spot in a tent. He said that the entire evening he heard the distinct sounds of dancing footprints outside his tent, but couldn't spot anything when he looked out. My dude literally could have been like one foot away from the actual devil. No idea how he managed to make it through the entire night, but honestly, solid respect. Either way, this guy's story is an exception, not the norm. I'd avoid this place at all costs, because if you don't, the devil might actually make you pay for it. In fifth place, we have the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose. Fun fact, California tends to easily be one of the top five most haunted states out of the entire United States. And it was a struggle today not making another list with purely locations from, you know, 
California. The origins for this crazy tale begin in 1881, when the passing of Sarah Winchester's mother, father-in-law and husband, William Winchester, of the famed Winchester Repeating Arms Company, all happened in under a year, leaving her with a very large inheritance, assumed to be around 20 million, and a 50% stake in the company, making her one of the wealthiest women at the time. If 20 million doesn't sound super rich to y'all, in today's money that would be about 561.6 million. Chump change, right? After living in Connecticut for the majority of her life, an arthritis diagnosis and meeting with a medium convinced Sarah to start a new life in California. She believed her family to be cursed by victims of the Winchester rifle and began construction on what was originally a two-story, eight-room farmhouse, which she purchased in 1886. She and her late husband shared an interest in architecture, and after dismissing all of the architects she originally met with, Sarah decided to do all of the home planning herself. She was known to rebuild and abandon construction if anything didn't meet her expectations, which resulted in a maze-like design. It is believed that said maze-like design was mainly intended to confuse and keep spirits from harming her and what was left of her family. According to paranormal investigators Mary Jo Ignafo and Joe Nickel, the bell tower built on the property was used to summon spirits, and Sarah was known to throw lavish parties for the beings she feared in an attempt to please them. It was reported in the San Jose News in 1897 that a seven-story tower was torn down and rebuilt seven times. Honestly, I respect the attention to perfection, knowing what you want, and you know, having the money to be able to not settle. As a result of her expansions, there are walled-off exterior windows and doors that lead to nowhere, along with staircases that end suddenly, and as the house grew inside, up to five additional levels were added to the home. When the 1906 San Francisco earthquake hit, the damage to the home was quite extensive, causing the collapse of the seven-story tower and most of the chimneys. An entire wing was destroyed along with the third and fourth story additions, and pipes began protruding from what were once window boxes. Before the earthquake, the house is believed to have had 500 rooms, and at the time of Sarah's passing in 1922, the house had 160 rooms, 2,000 doors, 10,000 windows, 47 stairways, 47 fireplaces, 13 bathrooms, and 6 kitchens. Visitors to the house today have reported multiple instances of experiencing cold spots, footsteps, cooking smells, odd sounds, whispering, doors and windows slamming, and feelings of being watched. Honestly, I still kind of want to visit it. In fourth place, we have Myrtle's Plantation. Located in St. Francisville, Louisiana, and built in 1796 by General David Bradford on top of a formal burial ground, this domicile is believed to play home to at least 12 different ghosts. So brace yourselves for a highlight reel. Our first ghosty story begins with a newly married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Clark Woodruff. Mr. Woodruff was a cruel and harmful man and owned numerous indentured servants, which was the icky norm at the time, and one in particular that he liked to, um, punish went by the name of Chloe. Now, Chloe tried to protect herself from the wrongful punishments by listening in on the Rudruff's conversations and modifying her behavior, which you know is kind of brilliant. Sadly though, one day after being caught eavesdropping, Clark had one of Chloe's ears cut off. Her mutilation was hidden, at the demand of the Woodruffs, by the use of a green turban. Even though most folks wouldn't see the damage, the painful experience would stay with Chloe and inspire her to make plans for revenge. On the ninth birthday of the Woodruffs' daughter, Chloe placed poisonous oleander leaves into the cake, intending to only get them sick so she could nurse them back to health and earn a favor with the family. You know, desperate times call for desperate measures. Tragically, the dosage was lethal, and it ended up killing the Mrs. and the offspring. After word spread of her actions on the plantation, the other servants were the ones to take revenge. Chloe was hanged by the neck for everyone to witness until the life was drained from her body and then her body was weighed down by rocks and thrown into the Mississippi River. Multiple visitors to the current location have reported seeing the transparent and ghostly apparitions of a young girl wearing a green turban moving throughout the property. In 1992, the owner took a photo that they believe captures Chloe's spirit. This photo was originally intended to be used to secure an insurance policy for the home in case of fire or other natural disasters, not to prove paranormal activity. The the presence of a human figure within the photo was undiscovered until it was developed. Many tests have been done to verify its authenticity, but make sure to let me know in the comments what you folks think after seeing it. Alrighty, what's next? Oh, the next owner of the property, a wealthy family man, and his five wards would pass away from tuberculosis on the property. The home was later passed to one of his surviving daughters and her husband, the Winters. Mr. William Winter was a proud member of his community and taught Sunday school out of the home. So one day, as William was teaching, an unknown man rode up on a horse yelling to see him. And as he came out to address the man, he was shot at point blank range on his front porch. William retreated into the home and staggered partway up the stairs before passing away in his wife's arms on the 17th step of the staircase. The sound of his strong and forceful stomps still linger in the home today, as visitors report hearing heavy footsteps from empty staircases. The overall paranormal activity became more noticeable in the 1970s once it was purchased by the Myers family. 
Oh, right, remember how I mentioned it was stupidly built over a burial ground? The ghost of a young Native American woman has been repeatedly spotted fluttering about. During the Civil War, the house was ransacked by Union soldiers, and legend claims that three were killed in the house, leaving a scarlet stain in a doorway, roughly the size of a human body that cannot be removed. Number three on this list is Ochate. Ochate is actually an entire village, and it's said that the whole village is haunted. This village is abandoned now, and maybe a big reason for that is because of how haunted it is. Don Quixote says why this village started to empty at the end of the 19th century is still not entirely clear, but illness, unfortunate weather, and a murder all had a role to play. During this time, there was sickness, especially the Spanish flu, which devastated the area and rain and hail that destroyed crops in successive years during the 1920s caused people to go search for a better place to live. In 1930, there remained only two families, one being a family of three and the other a single elderly man. Because a crazy pastor that frequented the village threatened pretty much everyone, the Aranguiz family decided to move to a safer village nearby. The elderly man, Yusbeo, wasn't far behind. Their fears were later realized when the crazed shepherd brutally killed a fellow shepherd in one of the abandoned houses in Ochate in 1936. All of this has obviously left its mark on this abandoned village and now it's just a mess of ghostly and paranormal activity. A hotspot of spirits, demons, and beasts. In fact, and this is almost something else entirely, but there have been literal sightings of UFOs here before. That's a lot of stuff for one tiny village in Spain. I would recommend doing exactly how the locals did and avoiding this village at all costs. Number two on this list is the Thorax Hospital. The Thorax Hospital has definitely seen some horrible things over the years. The hospital, which is now abandoned and out of use, is located in Teresa. Back in its heyday, it was mainly used as a hospital for those sick with respiratory illnesses. All of the diseases varied, but if it had to do with your lungs, then it was likely that you ended up here. The hospital sadly boasted a very horrible statistic when it was operational. It seemed that an uncanny amount of individuals would take their own life if they got sent here. Many believe that due to the nature of the diseases that we're referring to, many people died a slow and painful death. This process often induced a sort of psychosis where the individuals would start to lose their mind a little bit before dying. Logical thought was very hard for these individuals to grasp, and even though it was a house of the sickly, it also turned into a house for the mad. This is why a lot of these individuals would take their own life. One of the biggest legends surrounding this spot is the jungle. Apparently, there is a garden in the middle of this hospital. Patients would go up to the ninth floor and they would either be thrown off or jump themselves to what was called the jungle down below or the garden. Obviously, the nine story fall was too much for their bodies to take and they would die. That's why people believe this garden to be the most haunted of all the spots in this hospital. A very dark and somber place in Spain that shouldn't be gone to. And finally, number one on this list is the Malaga Tunnels. Malaga is a beautiful province in Spain by the water. It's a very popular tourist attraction spot that has some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. Underneath the fun in the sun, there are some deeply haunted tunnels though. Cycling Country writes, Tied to a grisly chapter in Malaga's history, when for 30 years a spate of young girls went missing in the area, some of their bodies were found near a river quite close to the Cortajo. Rumors soon abounded that underneath the building existed tunnels and torture chambers where these unfortunate women met their fate and with satanic rituals being performed. It also was a hospital and prison during the bloody civil war and quite possibly saw some executions and a lot of torment. The truth is, the tunnels did exist but have now been bricked up. The rest, well, you'll have to make up on your own mind whether this qualifies as one of the most haunted places in Spain. However, passing by this abandoned place sure is creepy. Disembodied voices, screams, lights, a sudden grip by a cold hand, and appearances in upstairs windows of people all add to the strangeness of this spot and have been witnessed by researchers in the paranormal fields. Unfortunately, this notoriety has caused a lot of damage due to thrill seekers trying to literally unearth the building's secrets. 
To add fire to these myths, in 2000, a film was made there using it as a backdrop. However, accidents, faulty sound, and battery problems plagued the production, and it was never finished. For me, this is definitely one of the most haunted places in Spain. We're talking about torture chambers, satanic rituals, murder. This is a horrible place that has seen way too many tragedies and horrors to be anything but a haunted location. If you go to Malaga, stick to the fun in the sun and stay away from the tunnels and this haunted building. Going down there may just be the last thing that you do. Number 5 on this list is the Devil's Pond. The Devil's Pond is a very beautiful and calm looking body of water on the outside, but it's far more dangerous when you step inside. Located in the Queensland forest, the pond itself almost looks like something straight out of a fairy tale, but there's no happy ending here. 19 people have died in this tiny little pond. That's a staggering amount of people considering how small this one area is. In fact, so many people have had tragic endings here that there's literally a sign that says the creek has claimed many lives. Think about that. It sounds like something straight from a Scooby-Doo story. Beware of this pond or else, but like seriously, beware of the pond. An ancient aboriginal legend tells us of how a runaway bride fell to her death here as she was escaping her wedding. The bride was named Ulana and it's believed that she is actually the cause of the many deaths that have happened here. It's said that she lures and tricks people into coming towards her and then they fall in and suffer the same fate that happened to her so many years ago. I'm not sure if the bride legend is true or not, but even if it isn't, this is clearly an incredibly dangerous spot in its own right. Australia is a big place, so don't feel like this is your only option if you're going for a swim when you're there. Number four on this list is the National Film and Sound Archive. Located in Canberra, which I actually just discovered is the capital city of Australia, always thought it was Sydney, but actually it's Canberra, so that's fun. But anyways, the Film and Sound Archive is a staple of media culture in Australia. It just hasn't always been that way. Crypto naturalist Tim says the NFSA building is regarded by many ghost hunters or paranormal aficionados as not only one of the most haunted in Canberra, but also one of the most haunted in Australia. It's not because it houses spooky movies though. The ghosts that are reported in the building stem from the period that it was the Institute of Anatomy. That's right guys, this building prior to being what it is now was housing and studying dead bodies for 50 whole years. There were countless scientific experiments that went on here, on hundreds to potentially even thousands of corpses. During this time, it was a museum as well and showcased the dead bodies to those who visited here. Because of all this death, the place is pretty popular among the ghosts. Apparently, the dissection rooms are the most popular with many paranormal sightings here over the years. There's also a little girl who many visitors have seen. She lives in the air vents of the building and pops out through the grates every now and again. Luckily enough, her intention Intentions aren't evil though and often tries to make people laugh. That being said, I still don't think that going to this place that used to house a bunch of dead bodies is the best idea. We have Netflix for a reason now guys, so let's use it. Number 3 on this list is the USS Lexington. The ship has its own museum dedicated to it now and it is 100% haunted. The decommissioned World War II aircraft carrier is riddled with different phantoms. This museum is literally said to receive on average hundreds of reports of ghostly apparitions in one year. That is so much supernatural energy that has just congregated here. Now World War II was obviously an awful time and if this boat played a major role in the battle Battle of the Atlantic, which I imagine it did, then it assuredly saw its fair share of tragedies. The ghosts are not quiet about their presence, they make themselves very known. One of the most famous ones resides in the engine room. Apparently visitors will go there and a spirit will form explaining the engines and how they work. Then when his lecture is over, poof. He will be gone in a puff of smoke. There's also a general sailor that walks around the ship and is actually said to be rather helpful. However, with these tame ghosts, there are some troublemakers as well. Small items that you may have on your person, a wallet, a watch, a phone, a keychain, anything like that are often reported missing after people get on this ship. If you do intend to go here, then hold on to your valuables very closely and get ready for a long lecture on engines. Number two on this list is Bragg Road. For over 
over 100 years now, this road has been haunted by a very strange and ghostly light. It's been seen by hundreds of people during that time, and nobody can explain it. Texas Highways says, in the heart of the big thicket is Hardin County, and in the heart of Hardin County is the infamous Bragg Road, home to countless sightings of the ghost road light that appears to nighttime travelers on the road between Saratoga and the defunct village of Bragg Station. Before the current road was built, the Arrow Strait Clearing served as Santa Fe Railroad's branch line built in 1903. From its inception, locals considered the line haunted by Mexican laborers murdered by a thieving foreman, a deserter shot by Confederate soldiers, a hunter lost forever in the woods, and a decapitated railroad brakeman searching for his head. But all the stories share a common theme, a floating orb of light. The road replaced the railroad tracks in 1934, but the light remained seen by hundreds of people over the decades. In the 1960s, Archer Fullingham, editor of the County News, spread its notoriety in articles. National Geographic published a clear photo of the light in a 1974 feature about the big thicket. Texas folklorist Francis Albernese documented sighting stories from the old timers and young folks alike. In 1997, Hardin County designated Bragg Road as Ghost Road Scenic Drive Park. A pretty road through the woods in the daytime turns into a spooky spot for supernatural sightings by night. Word is the most auspicious times to see the light are on moonless autumn nights. What the heck is this light that has been haunting this place for all these years? Even National Geographic, a very highly reputable column, has posted stories on it with actual photos including it. If it's a manifestation of some of these ghosts, then which ghost is causing it? And maybe more importantly, is it dangerous? If you want to find out, then you need to head to Bragg Road and look for yourself, but I wouldn't recommend it, honestly. And finally, number one on this list is the Yorktown Memorial Hospital. This hospital is definitely up there as one of the most haunted spots in Texas and could even make a play for the most haunted spots in America. It was built in the 1950s and managed by the Roman Catholic Church for a few decades before eventually closing down in 1986. Then for eight more years until 1992, it was a drug rehab facility, but finally in 1992, it closed for good. Since then, it's been abandoned and gained some very serious ghostly legends by the locals. One of the most famous demonic creatures that resides here is this black specter with bright glowing red eyes. It's not shy either, and will attack you if you're here alone or in a vulnerable state. This is the most famous of the presences here, but it isn't alone. The ghost of a man who appears to have a bullet wound directly in his forehead is also said to live here. His ghost is a lot less forceful than the dark demon though, and is said to just show himself to visitors rather than attack them. The spirits of nuns are said to be on the second floor though as well. These spirits are similar to our demon creature and will claw and scratch at people who decide to come here. Along with all of this, we also get our classic indicators of a haunted location, such as feelings of despair as you walk through, temperature changes, and moans echoing throughout the building. Avoid this place at all costs if you want to keep a tight grip of your sanity. Number five on this list is Tranquil Sanatorium in British Columbia. Tranquil Sanatorium has quite an extensive and tragic history to it, which has caused its walls to be the home to many undead spirits. A sanatorium, if you weren't familiar, is an establishment which has the sole purpose of helping housing those with long-term illnesses and is often associated with tuberculosis. The one that we're talking about right now is no different. It was built in 1907 as a facility to treat people with tuberculosis. However, it didn't stay like this for very long. The purpose of the facility eventually changed to become an insane asylum. It acted as this mental institute for a while until finally becoming abandoned in the late 1980s. Due to its deep history with death, disease, mental illness, it's no wonder that the Tranquil Sanatorium is now deeply haunted. The layout of this facility screams something out of a Stephen King book. It has several buildings that are connected by poorly lit underground tunnels. The building itself looks all too eerie from the outside as well with dirty cream colored walls that have seen far better days as rot and mold slowly devour them. Visitors of this place report feeling extremely uneasy. A common note for most people that visit is the presence of orbs. Strange balls of light that flutter throughout the building and then disappear. Some people have reported seeing a ghostly apparition on the sixth floor. This ghost takes the form of a woman not older than 30. She appears to be crying and screaming. The tunnels are said to be particularly haunted. People have reported screams coming from nowhere, flashes of movement, menacing and animalistic.
animalistic groans that make you feel as if somebody is right behind you. Children can also be heard playing every now and again in some of the more open areas of the building. Clearly this place's dark history has impacted it greatly and just because physical humans decided to abandon it in the 80s doesn't mean that it was truly abandoned for good. Number 4 on this list is the Firkins House. The Firkins House is part of Fort Edmonton Park which, you guessed it, is located in Edmonton, Alberta. Fort Edmonton Park is a little tourist attraction that has buildings from 1885, 1905, and 1920 to represent the homes of the time. One of the houses is the Firkins House. This home is interesting because during my research I couldn't find any particular evidence of wrongdoings or tragic events at this home. In fact, for the most part, it seems like a pretty normal house. People have lived there before and no harm has befell them, but it seems that after they moved out and the home was donated, that's when things started to go a little bit haywire. There are reportedly three ghosts or demons that haunt this home, each one scarier and more dangerous than the next. The first one is the ghost of a beautiful floating woman who is dressed in all white. People have said that they've spotted her in the windows of the home looking out at them or slowly drifting throughout the living room. The second one is the ghost of a little boy. The boy will appear to certain people looking extremely ill. It is currently unknown if this boy died in and around the area or what disease he is suffering from, but it is said that he resides in the home with the woman in white. The third being is by far the scariest of all three. A ventriloquist dummy that will appear in the home or in the cupboards. This thing can move all by itself and talk by itself. It is very similar to the popular horror franchise Chucky and it's said by some to be seeking to harm the living. I'm not sure if the ghost of the ventriloquist has taken over this dummy or if the dummy has taken on its own persona, but I definitely do not want to go anywhere where the primary residence is a demon puppet. In third place we have the Crescent Hotel. Located in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, it was erected in 1886 and has served several purposes over time, such as a luxury resort, a conservatory for young women, and a junior college. But the strangest mark on its history came in 1937 when it got a new owner, Norman G. Baker. Norman was a millionaire inventor and radio personality who decided to pose as a doctor despite having no medical training and uh, wanted to turn the hotel into a hospital that uh, could um, cure cancer? He was eventually found out and was run out of town, but his spirit somehow found its way back to the hotel and found some otherworldly company as well. The now operating Crescent Hotel is said to be haunted by at least eight ghosts, ranging from a small girl to a bearded man wearing Victorian clothing. When current owners Marty and Elise bought the hotel in 1997, they hired two certified mediums to do a reading of a building. The mediums found that the hotel showed signs of being a portal to the other side, as in a dimension that holds the spirits of the dead and can be accessed by those on the same frequency as ghosts. That portal is um, located on top of what used to be the morgue. One thing I like to stress, especially when dealing with angry ghosties, is to never disturb the graves. And a formal archaeological dig was done on the property in 2019, uncovering Norman Baker's bottle grave with some of the glass containers clearly showing fleshy remains, while others are believed to have held his assorted curing potions that never cured anyone. If you'd like to see them for yourself, they're on display in the Crescent's morgue. Oh, I uh, totally forgot. The morgue, complete with autopsy table and a walk-in cooler where Baker stored cadavers and body parts, are open for public viewing. The experience comes with seeing the ghosts of younglings huddled under the morgue's autopsy table, pleading for help, the reoccurrence of a Baker patient who also served as a hospital assistant being seen in and around room 419, better known as Theodora's room, the early morning loud squeaking of wheels in the third floor corridor, accompanied by sightings of a nurse pushing a gurney full of corpses down the hallway, you know, only to see it vanish into thin air. In second place, we have Eastern State Penitentiary. Penitentiary in Philadelphia. The castle-like penitentiary took solitary confinement to new levels when it was built in 1829. Prisoners lived alone, exercised alone, and ate alone. When an inmate left his cell, a guard would cover his head with a hood so he couldn't see or be seen. Now, the prison had to abandon its solitary system due to overcrowding from 1913 until it closed in 1970, although the forms of punishment did not get any less severe. Current reported paranormal happenings have included, you know, disembodied laughter, shadowy figures, and pacing footsteps. Yeah, 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 elaborating now. Cell Block 12 is known for echoing voices and cackling, while Cell Block 6 is known for shadowy figures darting along the walls, and Cell Block 4 tends to have visions of ghostly faces. Many people have reported seeing a silhouette of a guard in one of the towers. Oh, and that might not sound weird, but um, there's no way to physically get to the top of the tower today since the brick stairs crumbled away, you know, many, many years ago. 
One of the more legendary tales comes from Gary Johnson, who helps maintain the crumbling old locks at the prison. In the early 1990s, he had just opened an old lock in cell block 4 when he says a force gripped him so tightly that he was unable to move. He described a negative, horrible energy that exploded out of the cell while tormented faces appeared on the cell walls and that one form in particular beckoned to him. Although executions were not carried out at Eastern State, the prison was home to its fair share of deaths. At least, um, two guards were killed over the years, as were many inmates with their spirits still very much present. In first place, we have the Hotel Monte Vista in Flagstaff, Arizona. So with tourism on the rise in the 1920s, residents of Flagstaff decided that building a hotel was the crucial you know, next step in aiding the city's growth as one of northern Arizona's premier destinations. Fundraising began in early 1926, and by New Year's Day on 1927, the hotel was finally open, offering 73 guest rooms under the name Community Motel, which would later be changed to the Monte Vista, a name chosen by a 12-year-old contest winner. This hotel hosted one of the few hidden speakeasies in Flagstaff during Prohibition, which was, you know, a late night establishment fed by secret tunnels that were built by railroad workers and ran for miles below the downtown core. Over the years, it has adopted quite a few spirits, and I'd like to elaborate on three of them. Out of the many rooms in this historic hotel where the spirits of the past like to make their presence known, let's start with um, room 220, where an unusual one-time resident, known as the Meat Man, is still causing a stir to this day. This long-term boarder, who spent his days at the Monte Vista back in the early 1980s, had a somewhat unusual habit, hanging raw meat from a chandelier. No one has any clue why he did this, but um, definitely makes him memorable. One day, the poor schmuck was found dead in his room, Nothing suspicious otherwise, and what has happened in that room since that day is um, why he made this list. On one such occasion, not long after the meat man had passed, a maintenance worker for the hotel was up in room 220 making a few repairs. When he left, he turned off the lights and locked the door, but when he returned shortly after, he found that chaos had erupted in his absence. The television was fully on, playing at full volume, and even more distressing, the linens on the bed had been violently removed, ripped up, and scattered across the room as if in a fit of anger. The maintenance worker in question steered clear of room 220 from then on, but even today, guests in the room have reported the television acting on its own accord, though it you know, has long since been replaced, as well as the cold touch of a man's hands. Ooh. Next up, the rocking chair of room 305. So the most common report, which has been well documented, is of an elderly woman in the rocking chair by the window. Guests have long told the tale of the chair moving by itself, knocking against the closet, and some have even seen the old woman herself gazing longingly out the window. While the woman's name is not known, old stories from the hotel tell of a long-term resident who would, yep, sit by the window, day in and day out, looking out into the world, perhaps waiting patiently for someone to return. Finally, I feel like I'd be cursed if I left out the ladies of room 306. In the early 1940s, two women of the night were working their shift, only to be picked up by a man who was staying in, yep, room 306 of the Monte Vista Hotel and looking for some company for the night. The two women returned to his room, and that night were um, brutally ended and dumped out of the third floor window to the street below. What happened to these women was horrendous, and it seems that they agree seeing as their spirits are still haunting this room, lashing out at anyone who dares to stay there. In the decades since, guests have reported the uneasy feeling of being watched, as well as difficulty sleeping. Men in particular tend to be affected, with some claiming that ghostly hands have been placed over their mouths or throats while they sleep. Number five on this list is the Molly Brown House. If you live in Denver, then there is no way that you aren't familiar with this haunted place. Thrillist says you've no doubt heard of the Molly Brown House and likely passed it on the street once or twice too. Molly Brown was a notable member of Denver's elite and perhaps known best for being a titanic survivor and despite allegedly living a relatively happy life, visitors to the museum and staff have reported quite a bit of strange happenings. Some have smelled what's believed to be husband J.J. Brown's pipe or have witnessed lights off and on the fritz, and staff have reported furniture being seemingly rearranged. Sometimes, figures can even be seen roaming the house. A visit is worth it alone for the history, but the potential for getting a bit spooked or Walking into a cold spot is definitely an added bonus. We once again have one of those locations where no one has any idea why it's haunted. It just is. Maybe it's the connection to the Titanic that has got this place acting funky. Obviously, that was a very unnatural occurrence and took the lives of tons of people in a very sad way. So I could believe that the Titanic and the survivor of the Titanic plays some role into why this place is haunted the way that it is. Good news is, 
is that this isn't the worst haunting that you can run into. Like yes, you will get a little scared for sure. You might smell something funny or have a ghost pull something on you or even maybe have small valuables go missing. But ultimately you probably shouldn't be dragged to the underworld here by some shadow demon or anything like that. So I guess if you were to visit any place on this list then this one wouldn't be the worst. Just be prepared for what's coming because if you aren't then it could leave you with some serious mental trauma. Number four on this list is the Phantom Canyon Road. You need to be very careful on this road because there is a good chance you could suffer a serious crash if you aren't. Thrillist says a haunted road is one thing but a haunted road in Colorado means you're likely on the edge of a mountain and at some serious elevation. Phantom Canyon Road is a detour off the Gold Belt Tour byway connecting Cripple Creek and Florence and was originally the railroad for that route. As you drive along you can clearly see the ghost towns of Wilbur, Adelaide, and Glenbrook and legend has it that the reason for Phantom Canyon's name is credited to sightings of a man wearing a prison uniform walking along the tracks in the 1890s. The man supposedly had been executed at the Colorado State Penitentiary a few days earlier. So yeah guys, you better have your wits about you because if you don't, this ghost might come out and startle the crap out of you and then the next thing you know, you're going to be face deep into a tree somewhere. It also just adds to the horror ambiance that you're driving past several ghost towns along the way. Like of course they just had to be on the side of the road as you're also getting stalked by this ghost prisoner. No one really knows what this prisoner wants with you but let's face it I can't imagine it's good. My dude was executed back in the day so for one what he did was probably pretty bad to warrant a punishment like that and then secondly he literally got executed and I can only guess that his his ghost probably isn't too pleased about that. Y'all need to be especially careful if you're driving down this road because at any point this guy could pop out. Number three on this list is the Beechworth Asylum. Ah yes, the classic haunted asylum. It feels like every country has one but Australia's is particularly bad. The hospital opened in 1867 and was operational until 1995 when it was finally shut down. During that span when it was functioning the asylum had over three 3,000 patients die in its walls. That is an absurd number of people for a mental hospital. Part of this was because the methods that they used at this place weren't the best. Like most asylums that started in the 1800s, the treatments that they had for people dealing with mental health problems were far from ideal. Shock therapy, shackling patients up, just blatant torture were all things that went down at this asylum. Obviously this didn't help anyone in dealing with their issues and caused a lot of people to pass away early. Now these spirits spirits of those who died here haunt the building. Screams can be heard ringing throughout the walls with people thinking it's the ghosts of those who are being shocked or tortured. Some have reported seeing the ghosts of nurses walking around the building. These aren't your typical kind nurses though. People have said that they look evil and unforgiving. Deep feelings of depression can be felt here and just a strong feeling of uneasiness. Personally, I see absolutely no reason to visit this horrible place ever and in all honesty, I'm kind of surprised that the building is still standing. Number two on this list is the Monte Cristo Homestead. Built over 150 years ago, this home has had such a tragic history that many believe it to be Australia's most haunted home and honestly after reading about the horrific things that happened here, I totally understand why. Australian Geographic writes, A chain of violent events in the house have triggered other supernatural incidents. A maid once plummeted to her death from the upstairs balcony, and the figure of a woman in period dress has been seen walking along the veranda to the bloodstained steps where she fell. A stable boy who burned to death in his bed at the hands of his master is thought to haunt the coach house, while the ghost of a mentally disabled man named Harold wanders the grounds. Kept chained in the caretaker's cottage for 40 years, Harold was found curled up at the feet of his mother's dead body. He died shortly after being sent to a home for the insane. The sound of clanking chains is said to warn of his approach. All of those things are super scary to begin with, but the most sighted ghost at this home isn't even mentioned there. Elizabeth Crawley inherited this house from her husband who passed in 1910 and her ghost has never left. 
After her husband died, she went into a deep depression and would rarely leave the home. She converted one of the upstairs rooms into a space to perform rituals. It's said that after her husband died, she only left this house twice and eventually died in it by herself. Now you'll know her ghost is present because there'll be a sudden and stark change in temperature whenever she nears. All of this lore has, of course, created a ton of interest around the home and it's been featured on several Australian ghost television shows through the years. However, you can also stay at this home if you want it for $200 a night and experience all of this ghostly stuff for yourself. Why you would want to pay $200 of your actual money to get haunted and potentially even cursed is beyond me, but hey, to each their own, I guess. And finally, number one on this list is Port Arthur. Port Arthur is located in the Australian state of Tasmania, which is actually an island state 240 kilometers off of the Australian mainland. Port Arthur initially served as a penal site by the British Empire several hundreds of years ago. Towards the end of the 1700s, Britain stopped sending their prisoners to the Americas and instead started shipping them to Australia. What's even better than going to the mainland, though, was this small island state that they also owned in the middle of nowhere. Countless prisoners over the following decades were shipped off to Tasmania, with Port Arthur being one of the biggest final destinations for these criminals. Once they got there, their lives were never the same. Many of these people that were shipped here had committed small crimes out of sheer necessity, stealing some food to survive or something to keep their families warm. The severity of the crime mattered little to the British authorities though, and even if it was something as small and insignificant as this, you could very easily find yourself stuck in this prison for the remainder of your life. The prisoners that got sent here were forced to work tirelessly in the timber, lumbering, and shipbuilding industries. Port Arthur actually boomed for the next 100 years with more and more convicts being sent here. This was obviously very beneficial for the British government, but not so much so for the people who had to make this place their home. Many of them were mercilessly killed for no good reason. They were often tortured consistently if they weren't working hard enough or had done something that wasn't totally up to the standard. It really was a horrible way of life for those who got sent to Port Arthur. At around the end of the 1800s, Port Arthur started to slow down and eventually stopped altogether. The death of this location didn't end though, because in 1996, Port Arthur saw one of Australia's darkest moments ever. 35 people were gunned down in a mass shooting that took place at Port Arthur. All of this death from various generations has caused Port Arthur to be one of Australia's most haunted spots. In fact, over the years, there have been more than 2,000 incidents of unexplained paranormal activity. Things moving, voices, shrieking, change in temperature, you name it, it's taken place at this location before. The asylum at Port Arthur is said to be the most haunted spot here, with reports of people getting scratched and touched by unseen entities. Port Arthur has had a horrible history to it, and it's not a place I'd recommend venturing out to if you do happen to catch yourself in the Australian state of Tasmania.